Welcome to Drinking Bros, presented by GhostBed.com. Yeah, welcome to Drinking Bros, kids. Uh, D'Anthony, there's a little show on called Impractical Jokers. Yeah, I reference it uh, probably... Some say too much. Yeah, it's probably too Some much. Some say too yeah. much. Probably too much. Uh, it's one of those shows that is so beloved. I don't think I've ever met anybody who dislikes that show. Well, anybody I have met that, that disliked it, I've assaulted. Yeah, and you have to. And I'm still, point. I'm not in prison, so it's, it's worked out pretty well. Yeah, it's well. worked out. It's worked out. Yeah. Uh, we got Murr on the show today. How are you, sir? What's up, guys? How are you? <laughs> Good, man. I just You're sweating it out there. We're sweating it out here. It's, it's about 96 in Texas. Where are you at right now? Uh, I live in New Jersey with my wife and puppy and my garden and, uh, and my pool. And that's it. <laughs> I love Jersey. Are you outside the city or are you down by the, the, the coast? I'm in uh, Princeton, which is like central New Jersey. Right? Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, I had an ex-girlfriend from right outside that area. It's beautiful out there. Uh, your ex-girlfriend's beautiful out there? Uh, she, she was fine. I mean, not as hot as my wife, but uh, the one from college... She was okay, but I enjoyed Princeton. I enjoyed that area a lot. I like how you're just subtly trying to fuck him over right now. I know. <laughs> I'm happily married. God damn it. I just had a kid like two weeks ago, Murr. And you're going to fuck me like this? It's great. Hey, congrats, man. Is it a boy or girl? Is it yours? <laughs> it, well, <laughs> we had to wait to see the race, obviously. Everything <laughs> came out all right. Uh, so we got uh, two boys and a girl. This one was a girl. Um, but the, the hilarious thing is, as we're talking... I see Nick Cage in the background. My, I, I asked my wife when she had the baby, I was like, what do you want to do for our first date night? She wanted to go see the Nick Cage movie. Oh, the Nick Cage movie is great. It's the little Ryan Reynolds. I don't know. I always have a big Ryan Reynolds in the room, too. I don't know. I also have a, a, a giant cardboard cutout of Steve Harwell, the former lead singer of Smash Mouth in the yeah. house. <laughs> yeah. I, can't, I have a hard time. Uh, like, my memory, I can't remember what he looks like, so I always just think of uh, the Flavortown guy. Yes, yeah, same here. Like I was just going to say To that. me, that's the same dude. Ryan it is. Yeah. yeah. Is that the same guy? It, they're two, no, they're two very different people. You can't prove that. One though. was a celebrity chef, the other Steve Harwell, former lead singer of Smash Mouth. Uh, have you ever seen him in the same place at the same time? Yeah. Probably not. If you put blonde tips on Smash Mouth, it's Guy Fieri. It's Guy Fieri, yeah. I'm, I side with you on this one. So that's like that's like the Clark Kent. He just changes his hair a little bit and puts on glasses. I'm like, oh, that's a totally different person. <laughs> right? Maybe not. I don't know. You saw the Nick know. Cage movie? There, I, I did see it. We went to see it two weeks ago. I'm a huge Nick Cage fan. I loved it, man. It was so good. I wish I had seen like every Nick Cage movie ever because there's clearly so many inside jokes. I recognized a fair amount of the inside jokes, you know, like shots. Like, like for example, there's a scene, uh, him versus uh, the, the bad guy, Javier, whatever his name is from Wonder Woman, right? Yeah. Not Javier Bardem, the other one. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> although people say the Sal from Jokers looks like Javier again, and I've never seen the two of them in the same room either. That's and, true, yeah. That's I've true. Never, you never so, seen them in the same little, spot. Like little things they did in the movie, like Nick Cage and the, the bad guy are like walking in slow motion toward each other, and they cut to a shot of their fingertips like this, you know. Which uh, and you see the doves fly by. Obviously, it's a direct spoofy face off, you know. And there's so many like little jokes like that throughout the movie, of which I picked up a quarter of them, I'm sure. You know? Yeah, I, there was so many. I'm with you there where I was just like, man, there's some in this catalog I don't really know. Um, but yeah. the movie was probably my favorite comedy so far of the year. I mean, I, you know, I know they're not making comedies anymore. It's pretty much relegated to TV shows, which, which I think is, is why everybody loves your show so much. Um, you're heading into what, season 10 now? We start, holy cow, we start shooting season 10 in, in, in literally one week. We wow. start... Uh, but season nine starts on TV in two in three weeks. Uh, June sixteenth, new episodes start for like two and a half months straight, and then uh, we're filming season ten starting in one week, literally. And I think I lose the first episode. We'll see what oh, happens. Oh boy! Well, wow. so the, this uh, new season is uh, Joe's doing other stuff. So you guys are having like a celebrity guest on each show or something. How's that? What, what's the? You difference? know, it's, it's actually it's actually kind of something we always want to do anyway, uh, mm -hmm. and we've already done it. Right. So like yeah, yeah. we have celebrities on different episodes over the past 12 years. We did. We had Jeff Daniels in an episode. Mm. Fatone's been an episode. Rosie O'Donnell was in an episode. Uh, Imagine Dragons were in an episode. So we've kind of done this throughout as part of the punishments, you know. 
So we just kind of like embrace that because we can't replace Joe. He's literally irreplaceable. Mm. So instead of trying and failing at doing that, we said, let's bring in a different celebrity guest as part of the punishment only to help torture us. You know, it's only the three of us that get punished. Uh, although uh, this season, Joe Fitone is going to be on an entire episode mm. and I am going to punish his ass for sure. He's been going to be. He's been be- semi-punished before. I think he stood up in his own restaurant one time and said, my name's Joey Fatone and I shit my pants or something to that effect, right? That's exactly yeah. it, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, you, I, I've seen every episode a bunch. So it's one of the shows, I have a rotation of shows that I watch when I'm going to sleep at night. It just calms me down watching other people get trolled because that's all I really care about in life is trolling people. What, what, what other shows are on the rotation, I wonder? Uh, Rick and Morty's on there. It's always sunny. So I, I can guess yours, I think. Yeah. The Office, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, Impractical Jokers, Rick and Morty, and then am I missing maybe Community for you or no? no. I've, never even, I've never seen Community. 30 Rock. 30 That's Rock. It. Yeah, 30 Rock. 30 Rock. Really? Yeah. 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 It's a smart man show, and I think the writing is so smart. That's why the ratings were never great for that show. Um, but it's probably the best comedy writing close to. Uh, in TV history. Um, with you guys, I think Eric Andre is on the show this year. Is that true, or was that last season? Yeah, he was, uh, he was on a few weeks ago on the episode. And uh, coming up, we, we have an, an entire episode with Brooke Shields. We have um, oh, wow. Colin Jost, uh, Method Man, uh, Chris Jericho. Well, uh, Colin's brother's on the show full-time, right? He's one of your MCs, I guess. Colin's brother, Casey, yeah. has been our secret weapon for 11 years now he's uh been a writer on the show for many many years and now he's the director of our show too oh he's the director wow so i know he does the uh uh the i, I guess the after show kind of that you guys cut into the back end of the show that's that's always people love the bts stuff and he's oh, yeah. he's pretty good at that i mean that's i didn't know he's the director now though that's great he's moving on up moving on up in the world um with with eric andre on the show i i met him in real life and i went to a dinner with him is he always doing a bit or is he just what's what's his story working with him uh, yeah can you imagine like being married to that dude and then like three years into it he's just like oh just kidding and a bunch of people with cameras come out of nowhere that's what it felt <laughs> like dude i went to a dinner with him and he got super fucking high and he just goes hey everybody i'm really fucking high right now and i don't i'm not sure that i can have a uh this conversation mm. with anyone and it was just like i mean it was at a charity event and i'm like all right, and like, not we didn't really talk to him that much, and it was strange, but I didn't know if it was a bit. And I was like, dude, I never know with that guy. How was it like yeah. working with him? We, he, we, he, we've got along famously, all of us, but we also, I think, kind of speak the same language, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, he's got a long running hidden camera show, so do we. So, like, a lot of it was just like clicking on as to creatively how we make our shows, learning from each other. I had never met him before, I was a fan of the show. I've seen his movie and left my ass off. And I, I thought we really got along well. We're just instantly busting each other's walls. You know? Yeah, it seems yeah. like a marriage kind of made in heaven. I mean, it's like two, two people uh, doing something independently and you put them together and they do it well together. Well, when you do that type of comedy, that style of comedy out in, <laughs> in the public, you're, you're always wondering what the fuck is going to happen if somebody's going to punch you in the face, if somebody's going to be cool with the bit at the end of the day, things like that. Um, so yeah, I, it would make sense that you guys definitely get along. Was there ever a bit that didn't make it to air because you guys felt bad about it? Felt bad about it? Yeah. Like, uh, no. Uh, the closest we came, I, well, that's an interesting twist on the question. The question we get every single day is, well, the best you shot you can't get on TV or whatever, whatever it is. But a bit that we didn't air because we felt bad. Correct. An and, and I'll tell no. you why I asked this. I did a show for MTV and it was one of those things where you're in character, you take cameras in, whatever. We interviewed this old couple for an hour and a half, and they, they had no idea about the bit, nothing whatsoever. And I was, we were stuck in, in characters, and it sucked. I mean, I just, I felt so awful. I called the producers, and I was like, you've got to pull that. I feel terrible making these people look well, like assholes on TV. Uh, it was called the Barnes Brothers. What was the show? Uh, Barnes Brothers on MTV. The, the guy's name was Clay Crawford, who was my... Co-star from uh, Lethal Weapon. He was in Lethal Weapon. He was Riggs in Lethal Weapon. And, like, when we finally got out of this guy's house, I felt so horrific about what we had done to this, these old people and, like, duped these old people that I made them pull it. I'm curious if there was ever one bit where you were like, yeah. all right, they're just – these guys were not fucking cool with this. Got it. You know, the, the show doesn't really work that way. Obviously, we, 
we're not trying to prank people. We're actually the butt of the joke, right? So it's the upside down version of what you think. We're actually was making being made into fools by the public, right? That being said, the only time I can think of where the show was stopped down while the guys had a side conversation about whether or not they could go through something was a punishment against me. Uh, there was an episode where they took me to like a barber shop, and we're about we're literally about to film the intro for the bit. I'm assuming they're going to give me a stupid haircut or something. I don't know, dumb like they did in the pilot episode. And we're literally, the director literally says action, and Q steps off camera and says stop, stop, cut. We can't do this. I don't know. What, keep in mind, I don't know what's going to happen, right? Mm-hmm. So he pulls uh, Sal and, and Joe over and says, and I hear them whisper in the corner, clearly having a pretty substantial debate about what they are about to do to me. I had no idea, right? <laughs> and Q's pacing back and forth like like he's like, I can't, you know, we can't do this. It's too much. We can't do it. I'm like, what the fuck? What's going on? What are they about to do to me? I'm like, I don't know, right? And uh, and they come back. They clearly talk him into it. And he says, action. And they'll sort of start filming. And then they shaved off my eyebrows and maybe get a driver's <laughs> license with my eyebrows, right? <laughs> and this is right before, isn't this right before you guys went to London? It is, it is literally one day before we flew across the seas to film <laughs> an episode in the UK, right? So I have not a shred, not a wisp of hair. And then the day we got back from the UK, only a week later, we finished the episode, we fly right back. I go right back down to Virginia to visit my family. I was my nephew's confirmation sponsor in church, right? It's like a lot of people in this church. Everyone, every kid in the school recognizes me. All the parents recognize me. Yet I had, I was just completely bald. My whole eye, everything, my face. I looked fucking crazy. I got two things on that. One, <laughs> did you at all ever consider getting uh, Chola eyebrows tattooed on? That's question one. Yeah, we did. Dude, in the UK, we, we, it wasn't on TV. You can't find it. We used to tour with this video. When we were on, in the UK, we uh, had our makeup artist draw fake eyebrows on me. <laughs> You know, and I had to act in whatever emotion she drew on my face. <laughs> and we filmed it. It was like a sketch we used to show on tour, like two tours ago. It was so funny. Oh, that's good. <laughs> my second one is I'm pretty sure that Q wasn't necessarily concerned about you. He was more concerned about retribution, probably, right? Like, I don't know. this is too I, far. I, I think he thought it was crossing the line because, look, not everything grows back well anymore. So who knows if that my eyebrows are going to grow back? I never shaved. It took three months to grow back. <laughs> and the weird part, like I was still living in Manhattan at the time, and I'm commuting back and forth all over the place in the subways, right? The weird part was like a month and a half in, just like little strands of eyebrows were starting to come back. So people didn't know whether I was sick and was getting better or was on a bender that was getting worse or something. Like I was in this weird in-between phase of, I just looked strung out for like a, a, the middle couple of weeks. I looked strung out on something. It was bad. <laughs> now, if you're going to, I know you guys have to have uh, some level of secrecy about the punishments for other guy, one of the other guys, but if you're doing something like that, do they usually try to, like something that's going to affect the way you appear? Do they try to do it towards the end of the season so it doesn't, carry on through the rest of the season or do it at the beginning so it's a joke the whole season. You know what I mean? We, uh, we had this idea. I was willing to do it. We never did it. Uh, they wanted, without any explanation between seasons, to give me a full, like, Bosley hair restoration. <laughs> <laughs> right? like, would be like, here, oh, it would be spectacular, right? I would look like my high school self again and we would never acknowledge it. And then we start filming the next season and I just, you know, look like I'm a thick, luxurious head of hair. And then eventually when the series ends, they would announce that it was all punishment for the show. They forced me to get my hair redone. Mm-hmm. And I thought it was a great idea. That is a I also wanted a, I also wanted the TV show to pay for hair restoration for me. <laughs> it's oh, expensive, uh, dude. Yeah, people don't uh, understand. It's costly. Yeah. Well, that doesn't always work. Ask uh, LeBron James about that. I know. But it, sometimes it doesn't take, dude. You did have to wear Q's hair around for a while. That must have been. I did. You know, it's around here somewhere. Uh, oh, you still passport. have it? Oh, my God. It's still my passport, dude. It's, uh, if I can find it, I'll show you. It's my passport still has Q's hair. <laughs> so if, for those who and don't the watch. The passport lasts for 10, what, yeah, 10 years? 10 years, yeah. For That's those who great. don't watch the show, one of the punishments that uh, Murr had to go through was. Um, Q had long hair, maybe uh-huh. just yep. short of short of the length at the time. They shaved it off, turned it to a wig, and he wore it for the entire season. <laughs> uh, now, Q's got a bunch of cats and stuff, so I can't imagine what the... He also drinks a lot of whiskey. 
Yeah. So it's like whiskey and cat smell mostly. Oof. Yeah. Oh. He's looking for it. So we had a, a Memorial Day party this weekend, and we tried um, Jameson Orange for the first time. Oh, how is it? Which, it was really good. We polished the whole bottle. It was great. Hmm. You know, Jameson I'm a orange. pretty whiskey fan myself. So, are you pulling it out right now? What are you pulling out of there? I, 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 I think. I've, is this it? Yep, got it. It was in, it was in uh, the lockbox. Let me hide my personal information if you don't mind. You keep his. Uh, <laughs> 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 you had to wear that shit for what? Three months, probably, while you guys were recording? Six months. Oh through the New York God. City summer, man. It was the worst. Oh, now, those, those summers are brutal, too. Yeah. People don't realize it's just. It's humid as shit. I know, too, dude. Man. God, it's like heavy. It's heavy hot. Yeah, I, wasn't, there. I wasn't allowed to wash it. And uh, the, the wig cost us 10 grand to make. We had like. The country's best wig maker, like, sew it back together, strand by strand, in the exact follicle order. It was on Q's head. Oh. Ten grand, and he still couldn't get the smell of pot and whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know you guys started in an improv troupe together before doing the TV show and everything else. Um, did you guys win the New York Television Festival? Uh, how, how did the pilot come about? Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, so New York Television Festival was how I started in, in TV a long, long time ago. Uh, I had a, I quit the job I was working at. I didn't like it. Just, I was like temping at that point or whatever. And I said, fuck it. So I quit. I uh, had an idea for a TV show, or like an improv comedy show. I spent 500 bucks, shot it on my own, edited it together, entered into the very first New York Television Festival. Yep. I didn't win the festival, but I sold the pilot. I was the first... TV show to sell from the festival. So uh, we sold that to, uh, I sold that to a &E. That kind of launched my TV career. And then I went from that to eventually getting a job in TV development for the company that makes Impractical Jokers. And the guys and I had been, you know, doing comedy for many, many years. And we sold a, a, a comedy show, a sketch comedy show to Spike TV years ago before Jokers. Shot a pilot, didn't go to series. We shot a pilot on our own, didn't go to series. And then uh, Jokers was our third TV show, you know? Yeah, I, so New York Television Festival, I know very well. And you guys I, were this success story that they were like, you see, if you shoot your own pilot on your own, you could have a show on television. It's, one like, day. it's like Clay Aiken. Clay Aiken didn't win American Idol. Ruben Stuttered did. But Clay yeah. Aiken's the one that got famous. Exactly. And the, other, the, the people who won in your year, their show, did, I don't think, really went anywhere. But then you guys were the poster child for like, look what you can do if you go out and shoot your own television pilots. Yeah, the first year of the festival, I, I did not win, but I was, the, but I sold the TV show to A and A, so I kind of ultimately won. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, look, you, you guys are in your tenth season; like, it's it's an unbelievable run at this point. Um, the the thing that's wildest to me, I guess, about all your success is that it came off of True TV. And to be honest with you, like, we're huge sports guys, but unless March Madness was, wasn't on that channel, I don't know that I would ever flipped over to True TV, and then you guys were usually on right after March Madness, and I, I feel like that's where a lot of people fell in love with you guys. Yeah, you know, uh, I think it was uh, it was a smaller network. It's so funny, right? Like, when we had, we, uh, we pitched the show, we got uh, almost identical offers from True TV and MTV. Uh, the only difference was, like, the money was the same, everything like that. The only difference was that MTV wanted the show idea but not us they didn't they wanted to recast us with younger guys we were we were like 34 at the time right we were definitely out of mtv's demo and uh but true tv wanted us um so but uh, everything else was like, the same like the money was the same and everything like that so on paper you know mtv kind of seemed like the better deal because we could all keep our day jobs q uh q's fdny i was in tv development joe's a sales guy and then uh, uh, Sal owned a bar in New York City, right? And uh, so the advantage of MTV is we could have kept our jobs and still sold a TV show. Uh, and then we decided to try it one more time and try to give a try to give appearing on TV one more shot. And so uh, <laughs> talk about like forks in the road, you know what I mean? Well, now uh, True TV and MTV are owned by Warner Media. So yeah, yeah, Viacom owns everything. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, at the end of the day, you're all in the same family. Um, but the interesting part to me is it, it doesn't really matter. I say this all the time: what what television network you launch off of, it's the talent and it's that one show. So for True TV, I feel like it was Impractical Jokers. I remember with FX, 
Um, it was always sunny in Philadelphia. Well, they had from the comedy side, yeah, but from the drama side, they had quite a bit. Correct, right? but, but, shield and a, but just a speaking comedically and things like that, even pop TV, which nobody knows what pop TV was until Shit's Creek happened. Um, sure. Yeah, so I mean, coming off of True TV is wild. We had Steve Lemmy on, what was it, last year for uh, Tacoma? Uh, FD? Uh, yes, yeah, something like that. I don't remember exactly. Yeah, they've got some good programming coming out of True TV, and I feel like you guys built that network. How long do you want to keep doing it? Uh, you know, uh, as long as people, people – look, what, look at my job, man. I get to, like, I, you know, make my best friends laugh for a living and then, and then tour the weekends and tour the guys. And what a fucking great job I got. You know, like, it, it, I don't know what to do after this. Other than all, continue to make TV shows and write books and things like that. But um, what a sweet spot we're in and we've been in. And, you know, TV shows don't last 10 years at all and, and anymore. So uh, I'll do it as long as uh, it's still funny and the show's great and people love us, you know? Well, speaking of uh, the, the ability to continue doing the show, I know you guys do uh, more – uh, destination shows now than, than you did obviously early in the season and that's a function of having a bigger production budget and all that shit as sure. well. But part of it has to be like how you can't just run around Staten Island anymore. People fucking know who you are. Right? Everybody knows who you guys like are. How, how do you do anything anywhere in New York anymore? Uh, it's really hard. It's we go further and further away. You know, uh. we were supposed to film um, right before COVID hit. We were doing an episode in Australia and an episode in India too because those are actually our bigger markets, not the United States. We're the most, like the most fan we get is from India. Uh, and we were um, supposed to play uh, film in both those countries and then everything got shut down. So uh, yeah, we just keep, I, uh, there's some places I want to go. I want to do, um, I want to do either an entire episode or a punishment in Alaska. I want to do a Canadian episode. I like to do like a spring break episode, like a Cancun episode. It'll be fun, especially now that we're, firmly middle-aged and do not belong you know what I mean <laughs> Bongo in Cancun you know it'd be great fun well you guys had uh one of your uh live specials was with Travis Pastrana and Nitro Circus he's a buddy of ours uh that's always in like actually all of our friends are at his house right now Pastrana yeah they're filming yeah. for Memorial Day uh doing a bunch of stuff there's plenty of uh stuff you could get into there but I, I didn't uh was it Q that got hurt from that uh last time Oops. He broke, broke his, his ribs. ribs. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, we were rehearsing for the um, – that had to be the season finale of maybe season six. It was mm. like a live episode, a Nitro Circus uh, Joker's crossover episode, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, and practicing for it like two weeks before the competition, he was learning how to you know, ride the – whatever, the course, things like that at, at Pastrana's house. Mm. And um, and just hit a turn – hit a, a, you know, a bump wrong and flew off and – crash into the handlebars of the uh, uh, the ATV or whatever he was driving at the time or, or, or bike and boom, broke several ribs. You know, so, uh, so instead of him in the episode, uh, Fatone swapped in for him uh, for the live episode. So how do you guys like measure um, what's too far for these for these challenges and punishments? Yeah, is it you guys or is it actually the producers who step in uh, and be like, all right, we can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> we are the producers. There are, it's not like... You know, it's us. It's us. So, uh, yeah, I think it's just trust. Like, like there's one coming up, a little spoiler, I guess, uh, coming up. This is right on the edge of too far, right? <laughs> so they had me, they had, uh, the, the celebrity guest was Method Man from Wu-Tang, right? And they had uh, me on a panel of experts. Method Man was the host. And uh, so, like, you know, 50, 100 people in the crowd watching this panel on television, what have you. And they, I, I get introduced as James Murray from television, Nobody realizes that we're filming Practical Jokers. There's a number of other experts in the panel. But right before I went out on stage uh, with Method Man as part of the panel, uh, the guys had me insert a like a five-inch remote-controlled vibrating butt plug inside me. Inside of yourself? Yeah, this yes. is not the. This is the third time I believe that you'll be violated. And, and on they camera. control. They controlled the device on an iPad and it had like four different settings. You could change the setting and you could change the speed and intensity. And the settings were earthquake, tsunami, roller coaster, or smooth jazz. <laughs> <laughs> so as I'm like answering questions, I'm freaking leaping up in the air every minute. The audience just thought I was nuts. They're like, what's going on with Murr? It was great fun. That's like riding the edge too far. You know what I'm saying? That's well, really fun. I mean, look, when you start putting 
things inside your ass. Well, like, he's had a man inside of him, technically. I mean, it was a doctor get, checking his prostate. But sure. He, but was this in, is a full butt plug. Yeah. Now we're getting into sexual shit, which well, I like. Yeah. I mean, we all like it. <laughs> 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 they do like uh, public humiliation for you quite a bit for the punishments. I mean, uh, they, uh, I don't know how much you watch the show, but one of the punishments was they greased him up, put him in a bikini bottom to go out to a bodybuilding competition, but it turns out he was meeting uh, one-on-one with his childhood uh, crush. Mm-hmm. Wenny from Life Goes... Or what the fuck's the name of the show? Uh, Wonder uh, Years. Wonder Years, yeah. Wonder Years, yeah. Yeah, that's... Uh, did you, you didn't know about that ahead of time. That must have been pretty rough for you. I mean, that's no, like... Dude, I was still probably up there with the number one or number two most embarrassing moment in my life, for sure. <laughs> you know, gorgeous, right? Like, she's aged very well. And, uh, and I mean, everybody of a certain age had a huge crush on her in the 80s, of course, and 90s. And, um, and I, I just, in no universe did I imagine I'd walk in the room and there would be Dana McKellar from the Wonder Years. You know, it makes no sense, right? I didn't know if she was a fan. She lives across the country with her husband, kids. Like, I, I, I was blown away. The only thing as embarrassing for me was the Impractical Jokers movie. We were filming uh, a few years ago in Atlanta, um, and my birthday just so happened to fall in the middle of filming the, the movie. And so we're filming all day, one day. Uh, it's night. We, we wrap shooting at like five, six o'clock. The guys say, Murr, we're going to take you out tonight for your birthday. Uh, let's meet downstairs at like 10, 11 o'clock at night. So this is hours after we're done filming, right? We go out. It's the guys and I, the director of the movie, Russell Bar. I'm like nine or 10 shots of whiskey in. Uh, so we're all, we're all fairly lit. We go to a, a gentleman's club after the bar. And I go into like a private kind of back room and I got, you know, I'm getting dances from, you know, two different uh, individuals there. And uh, <laughs> as I'm getting, uh, getting uh, two dances, uh, the back wall of the strip club opens up and they flew in my entire family. It's like 15, <laughs> my, my nine-year-old nieces to my, my brother's-in-law, everyone in between. And they're all there singing me happy birthday with birthday hats on. And meanwhile, I'm drunk and uh, – and you know, excited and whatever. It was so embarrassing. It was right there, uh, even with uh, Winnie Cooper. You know, it's got to be like uh, for for most for most TV shows. As you go along, uh, production budget goes up, right? Yeah, and that's a good thing. It makes the show better. Uh-huh. You can afford to do stuff. You can afford celebrity people, whatever, but for, in your case, it's kind of a double-edged sword, right? Because it's just like more ammunition for those guys to fuck with you. Yeah, the more money you have, the, the better the pranks can get, and you can really amp shit up. Yeah, like R- Gary Busey's basically a regular on the show now. <laughs> yeah, he's been on a bunch of times. We, gotta, we just talked about the, him the other day, about using him again in some way to surprise the guys or a freak style out, which he does. Uh, uh, you know, a strong man. <laughs> he's a, <laughs> really is. Busey. Well, how is he to work with? We just talked about a story. So Black Rifle Coffee just hired him for a commercial. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's, he's been a running joke on this show for years. And uh, they finally rented out Gary Busey for the day. And I go, dude, I, I told Jared, I was like, be careful, man. That's going to be a long fucking day <laughs> to corral that guy. Because I, I did a, a movie with him years and years ago. And it was a fucking nightmare. And I go, just a heads up, dude. I don't think you know what you're getting into. What was your experience like? I mean, I, mean, I, love, I love the guy, you know, uh, I think he's a sweetheart uh, and a lot of fun. And I've seen him go out to dinner with him many times and seen him perform off Broadway a few times. And and uh, and he's always been very, very good to us. And his family are legit, like huge fans. But the very first time I met him with the guys and I were performing, gosh, it has to be 2014 or 15 or so. So we hear he's a fan of the show. We're performing in L.A., wherever, wherever, wherever. And uh, it's the first time meeting him. He comes backstage with his family. I had never, this is, we're five minutes from showtime, right? I had never met the gentleman in my life. Uh, the, he sees me, picks me up. He, keep in mind, you know, he's like six, five. He's a huge six, man. Yeah. Big, big guy, six, 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 seven, big guy, much heavier than I am too. And strong as fuck, right? Yeah. He comes up to me. He picks me up like a rag doll and, and then in the air starts shaking me and throws me to the ground. We're five minutes from showtime, throws me to the ground and spends, spends five minutes tickling me on the ground. 
I, you know what it's like to get tickled as an adult for like five, ten minutes straight? Excruciating <laughs> painful. And I couldn't get up. I couldn't move. I'm just, I'm like, what universe am I living in that I'm being tickled vor- voraciously, ferociously by, by, you know, Gary Busey. And then I'm sweating. I'm like, I'm like in pain from the tickling. And finally they prime off me and I go on stage and, uh, and that was my first encounter with Gary Busey. And now he's a dear friend. <laughs> he's uh did you ever watch that show that Comedy Central did of him? Uh, I'm with Busey back in the day. Oh, boy. Remember that? Yeah. And it was just madness. Oh, yeah. I loved it. That was one of my favorite shows. He used to do those Buseyisms. Um, yeah. Yeah. Fuck, dude. I, he was book. Yo, you got a signed book, too? Yeah, I got his Buseyism book. It's, uh, I think it's right above me. <laughs> Everything, by the way. Oh, every, everything that you ever referenced is within two feet of me right now. How is that possible is the question. Like everything we've brought up today, you've got within five feet of you right now. It's, it's, it's all here. It's all happening. <laughs> it's, it's, it's did he, let me ask you this. Did he make you pay for the book in person or did he just give it to you? Uh, no, he gave me the book for free, but then I did buy – uh, like four copies uh, from him as well to support a fellow author in front. Oh, oh yeah, obviously. So he, uh, on the way out of the production shoot for uh, Black Rifle, he was like, hey, I've, I've got something for you. Uh, and he pulls the, the producer over and he goes, I-, I wanted to give you this. I know today's been a crazy day. It's been a long shoot and everything else, you know. I wanted to give you this book and say thanks or whatever. Um, so <laughs> it's a terrible beauty, but whatever. Um, it's off the cuff. And, uh, and he looks at him and he goes, oh, all right. Yeah, it's it's been a day and it's been kind of a nightmare and everything else and uh, and I appreciate it. And then Busey just stops and he goes, "It's gonna be thirty dollars." No, no. <laughs> yes, come on. I'm gonna I'm gonna need I'm gonna need that thirty dollars. <laughs> and he wouldn't let go of his hands. He's in a car. <laughs> Where'd he go? <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. I knew he would have it. I realized he was up there. I realized he was in that drawer right there. There it is. <laughs> anything, anything else you guys want to know? I got it. Within, within two feet. You want an autographed picture of William Shatner? Got it right there. Come on, <laughs> dude. I feel like we're living in the same world. Uh, this I, I is got great. Anything you want. Do you want a, do you want, do you want a picture of uh, – I think I have it here. you want a picture of uh, Joe Fatone? Uh, <laughs> let me see. Rubbing my feet, got it right there. I don't know. <laughs> I get anything within two feet, you name it. No, I, I, got, I got the Zapruder film within about five feet here. That's great. Right. You've, got the, you've got the Patterson one with I, the Bigfoot. The Zapruder film is, I think, back and to the left. Yeah, I, yeah. You, you know nailed what? It. It's back to the left. Very, very clever. Uh, I do. Hold on. You mentioned uh, Bigfoot. Yeah. I uh, can't see it here. It, it's right there. I can see it. You won't be able to make it out. But in the, my backyard, right where my hand is, you won't be able to make it out too good here. But is Bigfoot? I have a statue of Bigfoot right there. <laughs> now, what's your position on Bigfoot? Real or not real? Yeah, real or not real. We got to know. My position, is, my position on Bigfoot is missionary. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's got to hold his legs up. Somebody's got to hold his legs up. Yeah, <laughs> those legs are going to be heavy, dude. <laughs> Uh, uh, you know, of course, I, I, I don't know. I, I love that stuff. I love that mm. stuff. Yeah, well, you named yeah. your book Area 51, so let's talk about that since you're, you're into uh, conspiracy. Yes. Oh, well. shit. I, dude, that's where I – oh, Area 51. We were in Roswell. I, that's when that story happened I told you at the beginning. I was in Roswell, New Mexico. We were doing something about aliens. Um, but that's where I felt bad because I got to interview the fucking guys from that. And what happened? <sighs> It was the guy was 81 years old and he was with his wife and they'd made us like rhubarb pie and the whole shit. Now, he was there in 1947 when the thing crashed in Roswell. He claims it was real and they took the two bodies into this base and then they shuttled them off to Area 51. Um, I, I'm real curious to hear your thoughts about that. Uh, I'm a huge uh, conspiracy buff, I'm a huge sci fi buff too. And I'm a huge science buff. So, like, literally a couple weeks ago for my birthday, uh, Melissa, my wife, I was one of those thought, probably the most thoughtful gift I ever got in my life. Um, she had arranged uh, private tours of the University of Chicago, their quantum computing laboratories. Oh, wow. And Fermi, I got a private tour of Fermilab 
outside Chicago. of Chicago. Yeah. Got this goddamn particle accelerator and see how they, they accelerate muons at the speed of light to recreate the Big Bang and shit like that. It was a dream come true. I got to meet with like like 30 different quantum physicists and things like that. So cool. Is uh, so I'm a, And I'm also a huge conspiracy buff. I love it. Uh, and we have that, you know, that conspiracy board game that they have. I just crush at it every single time. <laughs> uh, so what do I think about Area 51? I do not think Area 51 was actually spacecraft. That being said, it is so freaking cool to see, God, what was it, two weeks ago? Three weeks ago, the Congress held their first meetings in five, six decades on uh, UAP, the uh, unidentified oh, yeah. Area 51. So cool, man. I, I will say this, my prediction is this, within, not our kids' lifetimes, within the next, I say within the next 10 years, we will have proven the existence of extraterrestrial life somehow, within 10 years. Okay, so uh, here's what happened. So when I sat down with that, that dude, yeah, when I sat down with that dude, he swore up and down that this was real and everything else, and like I felt so bad about it that I was like, well, I don't know how to discount this either. Um, I mean, he went into the bodies and the whole fucking thing, and he was with his wife, too, and they'd been married for, like, 60 years, uh, and he was military forever, and I just, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't, I really don't know what to think. Um, we had, who was on the show? Uh, fuck. Uh, what was the subject? God damn it. It was aliens. We did a whole show on it with uh, sci-fi. It's our buddy. Damn it, I'm blanking on his name. Like Brian Keating? No, not Brian Keating. Um, Neil deGrasse Tyson. He produced all the shows for uh, for Sci Fi too. Uh, he did the voice. Worked for Kill Cliff. Worked for Kill Cliff. Man, I, you're you're talking around my head right now. I don't. Uh, Brinkus. Brinkus. John Brinkus. Oh, John Brinkus. Yeah, from God. ESPN Sports Science. Yes, That's what he's yes, known yes, for. Yes. Why didn't you say that? You son of a bitch. Because he's done like a million of the Sci Fi shows. We did a whole a- episode on Aliens with him, and oh, yeah. he bro- broke it down like bit. But I mean word for word of like why he doesn't think it's real. And one of his biggest things was he said, if you, if you could see spaceships and all that shit, do you think they don't have the technology where they, they don't need to have bodies in the planes flying the spaceships around? And that's when it kind of turned for me. I don't know about you, but. Um, yeah, I think if a, if a civil as vast as space as if a civilization was technologically advanced enough to get here, there's no reason to believe that we would just be able to look up and see them, frankly. I mean, it, it, like, that's, being able to travel through space, uh, it means they've either, either figured out how to use wormholes or that civilization is truly, truly ancient, which, in which case we would have no concept of what they look like. Right, right. and that kind of changed it for me. Where do you stand on it? Do you think all these sightings and everything else, all the videos you watched, do you think they're manned by aliens, or do you think these are just ships from somewhere else? Or uh, the best theory I've heard was that they were just actually defense uh, tests, you know, for uh, for other countries and things like that, like China and stuff. Uh, what do you think? Uh, gosh, I, I'm I'm trying to piece it all together. That's what's happening. I, every day I, I go a different direction with it. There's so many possibilities to explain all this. There really are. There really is. Right. The, everything from uh, I, I'll tell you one thing I, I have, I've been obsessed with lately is that we are not the first civilization to inhabit the Earth. Mm. I, I've been obsessed with it, right? So the Earth is four and a half billion years old. Humans have been around 200,000 years out of four and a half billion. If we, if we were to all go extinct tomorrow, if every human perished tomorrow on some kind of cataclysmic event, within... A million years, there would be no record that we ever existed. No skyscrapers, no concrete would be left. The Earth would have been just weathered itself over and and would have just processed through it all. And there would be no record that we ever existed. The only way you could find out if we were ever even here in a few hundred thousand years from now would be in like maybe radioactive isotopes from nuclear blasts we did, things like that. Might still be around in a certain amount of time. But otherwise, we're just a blip on the radar, right? So... I think there's been actually civilizations on this planet that might have been spacefaring long before we were ever around. We're talking millions of years ago or a billion years ago. You know? Star Wars, man. Yeah. A long time so, ago. Remember? Yeah, Star yeah. Wars is in the past, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just saying. Yeah. 
Um, but how much time do you spend on this? Is this something you would want to do later on? Because with Brinkus, after Sports yeah. Science, he did a bunch of those shows because yeah, yeah. he loved it. Well, um, he did Fight Science with Randy Couture, a number of other ones. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, but he, it, he, was in, he was interested in debunking most of these. Like, he didn't want to get, he, he didn't want to spread a false narrative about, all right, I, I'm not going to buy into Bigfoot. Here's why. Well, he's talking about, uh, so like the, the UAP sightings that we have. The one, the one famous one that the Navy released where the pilot's like explaining how that's not possible for the ship to have moved that fast. Mm -hmm. We know what that is now. It's parallaxis, right? The camera was moving and the, the object was moving at the same time. So there's a, there's a mathematical equation for why it looks as fast as it did. It, that, that's just basic science. Some of that stuff is easily disproven. What he's talking about, though, is more... I mean, it's almost... We, we don't know anything about what happened before we got here. Right. That's really interesting. People have theories about, like some of them, I don't, I don't know if aliens visited the Egyptians, for example, and taught them how to build pyramids. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure there's evidence for that, but there's definitely um, four and a half billion years is a long ass time. And we, we've experienced about every 60 million years or so, we've experienced a, a, a mass, like global casualty event of some sort, every 60 years or 60 million years or so. So... I mean, what the fuck, man? <laughs> we, every, every, every time we look into the, the geological history of things, it seems like every five to ten years, a lot of the stuff that we thought we knew gets disproven by new evidence, right? Yeah. So yeah. we don't know what the fuck's going on. Uh, are, you, are you interested in space travel and all that stuff? Do you follow, um, like, Elon Musk and those guys? Is that part uh, of it, yeah. too? I'm a sucker for all of it. Uh, one of the coolest moments of my life was, well, I mean, as evidenced by Area 51 interns. So obviously, I wrote uh, a children's book series on Area 51, and um, and the first book is about aliens. The second book comes out in October. This is about mythical creatures like the chupacabra uh, or the uh, the yeti. So the back cover, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm obsessed with all my books. All my books are thrillers or sci-fi thrillers. It's the Awakened trilogy. It's the first three I wrote, Awakened sci-fi horror. The Break is a sequel to it. Obliteration is, uh, I mean, you know, it's monster, alien, you know, kind of shit. Uh, Don't Move is a horror. Stowe is another thriller. So I'm obsessed with the space. Uh, it's one of the coolest moments of my life was uh, two months ago, I showed you guys a picture of Shatner. I was at a, maybe, no, I guess a few more months of that. Maybe it was over the summer last year. Um, the, the Three days after Shatner landed back on Earth, he was sitting next to me at a Comic-Con in Indianapolis. I think it was Indy. Uh, our tables were next to each other. I was like, I'm sitting next to Captain Kirk and he was just in space on, on uh, you know, uh, on SpaceX flight. Out, it was wild. It was wild. Blue Origin. Yeah, did you ask him uh, what his experience was like? Right, it was Bezos. Uh, I did, I, you know, he said a few words and it was amazing, you know, but I got a photo with him and I was happy. You, so uh, any chance... Must thinks we can get people on Mars in five years. Any chance if you guys are in like season sixteen, you do you go to Mars and troll everybody? Like you put on some kind of goblin suit and like, oh, look at Martian. <laughs> yeah, uh, maybe we'll see. Maybe maybe in like another four four billion years I'll do that. <laughs> I, hey, you look, it, it's happening now. You know, Tom Cruise is shooting a movie in space. What? Oh yeah, they've already greenlit oh, I it. Yeah, like a whole yeah. What's the details though? Who's doing it? What's the? How's it working? It's uh, Doug Lyman uh, who directed uh, Go and Born Identity and Swingers and all that stuff. Um, he's directing it. They're going to do it on. Uh, they're using SpaceX for it, and they're going to shoot. Um, I think on that station that's uh, the that ISS. They, yeah. yeah, that they docked on, yeah. and they're going to shoot it there. And I'm going to be honest. After watching Top Gun over the weekend. Um, I don't think there isn't a, a thing that Tom Cruise can do anymore. And I've also, I joined Scientology this morning. So <laughs> I've completely changed my life. Um, did, you, uh, did you mention Scientology? Hold on a second. <laughs> <laughs> do you have L. Ron Hubbard? Do you've got, do you have Dianetics in there? Remember, everything is only a foot away. <laughs> <laughs> If you're listening to the audio show only today, he just put out a cover. Why do you have Dianetics? By L. Ron Hubbard, one foot away from our conversation. Why do you have that? What do you mean, man? Everything's within arm's reach. <laughs> are, you a, are you in Scientology? No, I just like reading shit. Mm -hmm. That's hilarious. Did same. You, so, okay, same, yeah. But did you read Dianetics then? 
Yeah, I read it. What'd you think? Oh, you know, it's bashing. It's interesting. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. I, 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 lots of love and respect to anybody who believes whatever they believe. It's up to you, you know? But if that's not, is that, if that's not your cup of tea, I mean, you know, you can always switch to the Book of Mormon, which is right there, too. Ah, so uh, there you go. There you Did go. Did you get that one signed by Matt and Trey? <laughs> yeah. You think they would sign it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, 100%. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, they would, for sure. I mean, they, they don't care about doing sacrilegious shit. I just don't know if they would sign anything. Do they sign stuff? Yeah, they sign everything. They don't care. Mm. Um, those guys are gangsters. I, they... I like reading everything and knowing about lots of people's opinions and beliefs. There you go. Yeah, same. Because look, we exactly what you said. We fall in the same camp on that. Whatever you need to believe in to get you through the day, I don't really care what that is as long as you're not, you know, shooting up a school or something. Like, it's, it's fine. Um, so Dianetics, Mormon, whatever. Uh, we don't really give a shit here. Um, but is there anything that you read that, that maybe changed your mind towards something where you're like, ah, I didn't think this yeah, one way, but I'll switch. You're, you're kind of skeptical by nature. Yeah. Uh. My favorite book is right here. Oh, and this is a book. It's an old book. It's probably from, gosh, I don't even know what year. Probably the 1800s. Uh, it's an old, old one. I don't even know what year. It's called Flatland. Mm, yeah, Has yeah. you heard of it? Yeah, it's about, well, yeah, Flatland, yeah. Uh, 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 Carl Sagan talks about it quite a bit. Yeah, it's uh, it's certainly not new. It's it's I, I don't know what year it originally came out. I think it was the 1800s. But uh, this kind of changes the way you think of of life in general. You know, that one kind of affected me a lot. You know, I've never asked you because you you read all the time as well. What's uh, what's your favorite book of all time? My favorite book is Speaker for the Dead by Orson Scott Card. It's the sequel to uh, Ender's Game. Okay. So people. Oh, wow. After watching the, the shitty movie that they made, uh, and the Ender's Game movie, it was terrible, by the way. Uh, they completely missed the whole point of the book. For anybody that's read the, um, read the series, they would know that. But it's um, the point of in, both Ender's Game and Speaker for the Dead is that it is misunderstanding for, through lack of communication and fear that usually leads to conflict both in your personal life and on a global scale or in, or in this case interstellar scale that's the point of it we had we actually had or scott card on the show yeah we had him on the show in 2019 to talk about it I it was an it, awesome episode yeah yeah he's he's uh i mean he's kind of a weird dude yeah but he's a writer so they're all kind of weird dudes but yeah that's my favorite book the speaker for the dead is a guy it's kind of a religion where instead of having a wake or a funeral or whatever mm -hmm. Um, the speaker for the dead will come investigate your life and then speak your life back to the community, good and bad, all at the same time. And the, uh, the idea is that uh, sunlight is the best disinfectant, right? Mm -hmm. Like just saying things plainly and truthfully heals a lot of shit or at least forces you to take the steps to heal it, right? It's my favorite book. Yeah. Uh, mine is uh, Art of the Steel by Ricky Henderson. I'm a huge Ricky Henderson fan, so as a kid... Uh... <laughs> It changed my life. It, it, it made a white kid steal bases in Little League. So I feel pretty positive about that and, and the outcomes that it's had on my life. If you so. had a digital copy of that in like Microsoft Word and you control f Ricky Henderson and then replaced with the word I, <laughs> that'd probably make the book better. Because he refers to himself in the third person, first and last name, quite a bit. Yeah, because we've done a lot of episodes. I think we're over 1,300 episodes on this show. It's one of those things where we have our, our last remaining guests that we've never had on before that we love more than anything in this life. Mine, mine is Ricky Henderson. Yeah. We've never had him on, and we hit up our publicist, and we were like, hey, dude, can we get Ricky to come on the show? And they were like, no, he won't do any interviews whatsoever. Because I just want to have – I've never had an interview, a full one, where somebody's in the third person the entire time, and that's my dream. <laughs> Unless they, like, the only person that would do that is uh, uh, maybe a member of the royal family where they're using ro royal pronouns to refer to themselves or a group. Oh, yeah, Otherwise, yeah. nobody talks like that. Yeah. And there's a reason, because it's uh, fucking crazy. <laughs> we have uh, Michael Bolton on our TV show. Oh, oh shit, dude. I love Michael Bolton. That fucking, that song he did with uh, uh, Lonely, uh, Island. Lonely Island, the yeah. Jack Sparrow song, is the funniest shit oh. I've ever seen in my life. God damn it. He's got like a great sense of humor. He's, you know, when have heard he's a fan of the show. We're trying to get him. And uh, I have a custom 
a pair of Michael Bolton sneakers too that light up. It's got like lightning bolts inside, and it's got his face on the back of the sneakers. And we look inside the sole of the shoe or is, is his face too. Where the cl- fuck did you get this? Yeah, where did you get that? I had it made. <laughs> <laughs> Designed it and had it made. You know? well, well, if you're out there in the audience and you can hear the sound of my voice right now, go to go to Michael Bolton's social media, whatever he has, and yeah. tag him in this and tell him that Murr wants him for the show. I'm sure he would show. be into it. He would love uh, this. Yeah, show. I'm sure he would. He's popping up in a lot of things these days. If it happens in season 10, uh, you heard it here first, mm. that uh, we have willed it into being. We'll, we'll make it happen. Our fans are crazy. Yeah, yeah, we can, we can make that. I think we can make Bolton happen. Uh, there's only a few that we've requested publicists. Why? I remember Ari didn't know uh, one of the people that I pitched. Mm. Do you know Michael McDonald, the lead singer of the Doobie Brothers? Everybody knows sure. Michael McDonald. Yeah, that's oh, what. Uh, yeah. Oh, I can't <laughs> forget how I feel. Like that guy. Yeah. Have you seen a forty year old virgin? Come he didn't on. know. <laughs> he didn't know who it was. And I was like, he goes, who the, who the fuck is that? And I was like, it's fucking Michael McDonald, dude. Like, do you not know who Michael? And he's like, no, I don't yeah, know. Yeah. Well. Is. What are you going to do? He's an Orthodox Jew, so like that's probably not his music, our, our, uh, our guy. So I, I actually don't know what he listens to. I, gotta I don't either. Now I'm, now I'm really curious about that. Because like he, he's, I guess he's in his early 30s. That, that might be too young for Michael McDonald. I, just, I think every Jew from New York in, in, uh, in New Jersey in that era. They're usually pretty plugged into the music. Scene, yes, though, right? and it's usually hip hop. Um, oh, I, see, I don't yeah. know if he'd be down with my. No, he Bolton does. He he does like hip hop. That's that's true. Huh? Interesting. Who else is on your hit list to get? I think somebody like Julia Roberts would be great. Uh, I mean, sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Could you get Jesus as well while you're at it? <laughs> sure. Let's add Tom Cruise to the list too. Once he's done filming outer space, he'll come. You know, make fart jokes on Channel One Million. Let's do it. I don't think it's too far fetched. I remember. I, I think it was a Dave Matthews video. She just happened to be a fan of Dave Matthews and just reached out. Um, has there been somebody like that that just shocked your mind that just reached out and was like, dude, I'm dying to do the show? You know, uh, the closest we came to that experience you're describing was we did a show two years ago when COVID first kind of came around and everyone found themselves like just suddenly locked at home for yeah. a year straight. Um, we, uh, we created a show called uh, Impractical Jokers Dinner Party. And the idea was we shot from home. We, we, we had no crew. We literally set up a camera in our living, in our dining rooms or, you know, kitchen table, what have you. And uh, we just eat dinner together and bullshit it. And uh, we put it on TV and cut the whole thing together. And we used to surprise you. We took an episode that we were producing on our own. So the guys had no idea who I was going to bring on the episode. And I would call in favors, things like that. And so we called in a favor and got Jeff Daniels on an episode of the show. He's been on Jokers before. And then while we were talking to him on that episode, Q retold the story of, uh, you know, Jeff Daniels was on Broadway in To Kill a Mockingbird. We went to see it. This is how we first met Jeff Daniels. We became fast friends from it. And if, like a year or two later, when Jeff Daniels finished his run on Broadway, Ed Harris picked up the show. He, he, became, he took over where Jeff Daniels finished. He took over the same part of, uh, what was it, Atticus Finch, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Killed- so, uh, so he took over for, for Jeff Daniels. And so Q one day is coming, is walking down Broadway or something and sees Ed Harris come out of the stage door for To Kill a Mockingbird. So out of some like kind of delusional sense of loyalty, out of place loyalty to Jeff Daniels, Q shot Ed Harris a nasty look because he took over the part of Atticus Fitch, right? Thought, yeah. For no reason. Ed Harris didn't deserve it. He doesn't know Q. Anyways... So as a surprise to Q, we reached out and brought Ed Harris onto dinner party to, to react to the story <laughs> told of him giving a nasty look to Ed Harris. And Ed Harris called him out, called his ass out and said, what the fuck, man? What are you doing? Why are you shooting me less nasty looks when you come out of a Broadway show? It was great fun. But it wasn't like uh, Jeff got fired or anything, right? No, he just left and we, he just was this misplaced loyalty to someone that finished his run on Broadway, you know? That's really funny. That's amazing. Ed Harris, though, is that dude where he's just super serious all the time. So, like, who knows? He's in Top Gun, yeah, too, by the way. That, have you seen Top Gun? Have you seen it? No, no, no. no don't, 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 no spoilers. I, 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 dude, I got to go back and watch the original, though. I don't remember shit from the original. Well, it's probably somewhere in your office right there. Yeah. How is it not by you right now? 
He's got the he's got the DVD. <laughs> the only thing I remember, I remember Hot Shots more than Top Gun. Do you remember Hot Shots? Oh yeah, oh, yeah. and Part Two, and Part like, Two. I, I remember every spoof of Top Gun. I don't remember Top Gun. It's in original. So it's mostly I about remember, volleyball. I think. Yeah, it's a volleyball movie. Volleyball. Yeah. You know, was it good? Better than the original? I've it's heard? it's it's uh, in my estimate. I'm not one of those people that gets um, nostalgic about old movies. Like uh, my girlfriend and I tried to watch. I've never seen The Goonies, right? And we tried to watch it the other day, and I'm and I'm. She's like, "Oh no, you've got to watch it. It's such a great movie." And uh, we're we're 15 minutes in. I'm like, "This." I I didn't say a fucking word. I wasn't going to be because I'm usually uh, what's the word? I'm usually a cunt. <laughs> right, uh, uh, pretty pretty openly. It's kind of part of my character, but um, I didn't say a word. And she uh, twice asked me, "All right, so are you done with this?" And the first time she said it, I thought she was trying to be polite. And then the second time, like, hey, we don't have to do this if you really don't want to. The second time she said, it, "I'm like she did, she hates this," and I'm like, I pause. I'm like, you, "This fucking sucks, doesn't?" And she goes, "Yeah, this is terrible. This is not at all what I remembered." I'm like, "All right, cool," but I did watch the the Top Gun movie again. It's still good. Yeah, it's so but, good, yeah. but this movie is, from what I know about being in the military and shit and some of my experiences with aircraft, this is the best movie that has aircraft in it that I've ever fucking seen in my life. I mean, it's so good. The, the way that they handled the cinematography for this shit. Uh, I mean, the story is really cool, too. And it's, it's very self-aware and hokey when it makes sense to be. Right? Yeah, a, yeah, little, yeah. a little campy when it makes sense mm-hmm. to be because the original kind of was, even though it's got a tragic uh, uh, story storyline in it but it's a little hokey when it needs to be but it is it's the it's good it's you should you're gonna enjoy it it'll be one of your best summer movies there is probably that and that new thor will be the one that everybody talks about like top gun tore my face off and i took my kid and uh he he actually wanted to see it from the commercial he didn't even know there was an original one um but man it, it, it we saw an imax and like dan was saying the visually the shots of the aircraft and everything else like and it's so loud Mm -hmm. i mean they just dialed it up so you felt like you were there and when those engines turn on i mean it it, you you feel like you're pushed back in your own seat and you're like holy shit this is awesome Mm -hmm. i mean there there were some shots to dan's point about it being real and everything else there was some shots that i was like how did you do that i I just physically don't know how you did it yeah i don't want to spoil anything to for you but uh just when, when the really fast or hard maneuvering flight scenes happen, look at their face, like really focus on the face. Cause you can see they're like experiencing real G's, probably five to seven G's, honestly. Yeah. Like it's, you can see it, your face will start to sink in at like three and a half to four, mm-hmm. but to make it noticeable, like it's, it's about five and a half is where it starts. And it's pretty noticeable. It's not like, yeah, it's not seven to nine, seven to nine is where you look like ghoulish. Right, right. <laughs> but but five to seven is where you can definitely tell, and they hit that a couple of times. It's very impressive. Yeah, we uh, we, we I, I for I forget what episode it was like. Um, we did like a tribute to the military for an episode. Uh, maybe it was the season seven finale or something, and uh, it was like a special two hour episode of the show or whatever. And so as part of the uh, the end of it, they had me ride in a fighter jet, right, uh, mm-hmm. tandem with the guy, and uh, and we hit like four Gs. And the guy, I, I, before we're on the ground, I said to the pilot, I was like, so what's going to happen? He goes, well, here's what's going to happen. Um, first, you're going to get lightheaded. You're going to start to see um, tunnel vision, we call it, right? Mm-hmm. Suddenly, you don't see what's right ahead of you, and the edges of your vision become dark. He goes, and then you're going to black out entirely. He goes, then you're going to wake up and vomit all over the place. I was like, okay, bro, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. I get on the plane. My edge, the edges of the vision goes dark. I black out. I wake up and puke everywhere on TV. <laughs> I, so they didn't. Uh, they didn't teach you their chiefing maneuver, uh, like how to stay conscious and stuff, because they wanted you to black out and throw up. Right? Yeah, they wanted they, you to. Better TV to see Mur look like an idiot. You know? <laughs> Third person. <laughs> me and my wa- me and my wife did it. I uh, we had a bet between each other of who would throw up, and because uh, I had somebody give me that heads up before yeah. going in. Um, she threw up all over the place. I mean, she barely lasted five minutes in that thing. It was awesome. I mean, you have to basically, it, it's at 10 G's, you feel like you're at 2000 pounds. Nobody goes 10 G's, but at seven, you feel like you're probably three times your normal body weight. Right. Which yeah. means the pressure of your chest on your lungs and your shoulders down on your lungs is a lot to overcome. So you have to like force every inhale and every exhale. 
And you have to do it in a way that doesn't – like, you have to train for this sort of stuff. Right. You can't – even if they had taught you how to do it, you probably would have fucked it up anyways, to be honest. But, but hey, did you have fun? I had a fucking blast doing it. It was one of the funnest experiences of my life. Yeah, when, it, when I had uh, finally cleaned up from shitting myself, too, <laughs> I had a very <laughs> It finally stopped defecating at 10,000 feet. I loved it. You need to to get in on this fucking Tom Cruise movie and be in space. I know. You've got the look. You've got the look. You're a distinguished looking guy. You could be an astronaut. He looks. You watched The Musk. Did you watch The Musk uh, documentary on on Netflix that that just came out? He's on my phone. Everything's within one foot, guys. Everything's within (laughs) one foot. One foot from where we are right now, on my phone, as we speak, is the doc. Have you finished it yet? Yeah, but you haven't watched it. No, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I'm almost an hour in. Mm. It's literally on my thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's wild. So with that, like, dude, I, I enjoyed the shit out of it, man. I thought it was awesome. Yeah, I'm enjoying it so far. I'm a sucker for this stuff, you know? Yeah, so I mean, look, he's taking TC up to space. I, all I'd say is get in on it, because when you watch that doc, the one guy kind of looks like you. He's a little, he's a little older than you, but that's you have the look for it. Okay, so so, so here's what we need, uh, uh, the Mer- America, the world. If you're listening, uh, I, here's what we need from you: three things. Okay, first, we need your collective help to get Michael Bolton on Impractical Jokers. Mm-hmm. Second, we need Julia Roberts to get on the show somehow. <laughs> Third, we need a, a middle-aged reality TV star named Murr to somehow get to be in the in the Tom Cruise movie film the IS on ISS. Can your fan base make this happen? We will find out yeah. uh, over the course of the next week. But now the challenge is put out. Let's start with uh, Bolton first, and then we'll go start with, start with the one that's actually realistic. Yeah, that that <laughs> one is probably real. Julia Roberts, she she has an Instagram. But like, there's the, the comments are disabled. You can't get a hold of, of Julie Roberts. Let's face it. Tom Cruise is shooting like nine movies back to back, and I'm sure they're going to do another Top Gun three after uh, this one made 152 million dollars this weekend. So I'm sh- I'm sh- yeah, I broke every record there was. I'm sure that's going to be in the pipe soon. Uh, but we'll work on it. Uh, now right. now's the point in the show. We get to the drinking bro of the week, which is someone who has inspired you or helped you become the person you are today. Who would you like to give the drinking bro of the week to? Oh wow. Somebody, you mean somebody from my life? Or so, what do you mean? Yeah, Just could be any- alive, dead, anybody that inspired you. Real or fictional? Uh, real or fictional? Yeah, sure, yeah. Maybe Huckleberry Finn inspired you. Yeah. yeah sure, I mean, you know. Uh, <laughs> gosh, uh, wow, good question. I guess it's got to be my dad, right? I mean, everybody says that, right? Mm-hmm. Do you think? Most, people, most people, people say their mom or dad. Yeah, I'd both, say yeah. Se- it's probably, what, 70% yeah. mom, dad? Yeah. yeah. Gotta be right. Like I remember, we used to. Um, so I had a party here this weekend, right for the holiday, and uh, uh, and then a few weeks we were having a Fourth of July party. And I remember growing up, my my father used to throw the party that I'm throwing, right. And I remember when we were like, you know, in our twenties, all the guy, all my guy friends would be in the pool playing volleyball, and all of the all of our girlfriends would be around my father at the bar. They're all, uh, you know, 24, 25 years old, and he's making margaritas, and he was the hit of the party, right? And so he was the smartest one at the party. He's you know surrounded by the chicks making margaritas as all the idiot guys are in the pool just being jerks. And uh, he was uh, the life of the party. You know what I'm saying? So it's got to go to dad. That's awesome. Is he still with us? He is. He is. What does he think of all your success? He's got to be unbelievably proud. Yeah, he's not with us in that way anymore. You know what I mean? He's um, he is pretty severe Alzheimer's dementia now, but. Um, but before that struck, he was, uh, uh, he was very proud. Yes. That's awesome. Well, at least he got to see you make it. Yeah. Uh, congratulations on all your success. Season 10 is, is coming up soon. In the meantime, what, season 9 starts in two weeks, you said? It starts June 16th. Uh, I'm on tour all over the place, Long Island, and uh, in, in two weeks to three weeks, uh, and uh, uh, North Carolina, and... Uh, you know, all over the place. Uh, go to merlives.com to get tickets to that. And uh, Joker's back June 16th. We start filming the new season in one week. Can't wait. Awesome, man. Can't wait. Uh, thanks so much for being here. We greatly appreciate it. And then we'll call you about uh, Michael Bolton next week, okay? Let me know what happens. All right, fellas. <laughs> <I will. laughs>
Thanks for being here. Check out the new season of Practical Jokers. Uh, it is out in two weeks. For D'Anthony, D'Anthony Holloway, I'm Ross Patterson. This is Drinking Bros Podcast. Good night, everyone.